to another edition of RCE. Again, I'm your host, Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. On there, you can find a link to a list of all the existing shows that we've already finished. You can download the full MP3, subscribe by iTunes, RSS feed, and all that stuff. You can also nominate topics for future shows. We're always looking for topics coming in from out there um, in the community and you know, what people would like to see. Today I have a guest from, I believe, Sandia National Lab, he can correct me. He's a developer for the piece of software, otherwise known as Ice-T, which I believe is a parallel um, image compositing engine. I, I know nothing about these things, so I'll let him introduce that and he can correct me. Uh, Ken, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right. Well, like you said, my name is Ken Moreland from Sandia National Laboratories. You got that correct. My experience is in parallel distributed and scalable graphics and visualization. I got my start in this field oh, about 10 years ago when we were working on ICT itself and I've, uh, I've gone on to work on you know, very large distributed systems. I am a regular developer, for example, of, of the Paraview large-scale visualization system. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and tell us what ICT is? All right. Well, as you basically alluded to, ICT is a library to assist in large-scale distributed memory parallel rendering. The name IST is an acronym for Image Composition Engine for Tiles, and at its core is a set of very fast image composition algorithms. Now, the basic idea is to take a collection of images, each with partial information, and combine them to, complete, to one complete image. And this is a standard technique for parallel rendering for close to two decades now. What makes IST truly unique is that we can perform this image composition on large format tile displays, and I know of no other system that is capable of doing that. Okay, so this is one thing where I ran into trouble searching for this because there happens to be a certain wrapper out there known as Ice-T. Uh, what, what is the official spelling of Ice-T? And I know there, there's an entire paragraph on the Ice-T website about this. Yeah, so it's a, it's a long and rather stupid story. So originally Ice-T wasn't called Ice-T. It was called MTIC for Multi-Tile Image Compositor or something like that, and uh, one of my colleagues came up to me and said, you've got to rename it because no one can remember that name. And at the time, for some reason, I thought it had to be an acronym that actually made sense. So I thought very long and hard about something that was pronounceable, and I, I came up with ICE-T uh, for Image Composition Engine for Tiles. And originally, it was all caps with a dash, and for some reason, I, I saw people using camel case, probably because you can't use a dash in identifiers in C code. So I switched to using the, the camel case, but you still see both in practice. Neither of them Googles very well, so if you wanna if you wanna look for it, you should type my name in and then type ICT and it'll show up. <laughs> okay. So uh how did you exactly where where did the idea for ICT come around? Was it just the age of the existing algorithms out there didn't map to newer systems? No. So what happened was that this group began experimenting with parallel rendering in the late 1990s. And at the time, most of the large-scale visualization was done on what we called big iron SGI machines. There's these big expensive boxes with lots of memory, lots of cores, and most importantly, lots of graphic pipes put together in, in a computer that was about the size of a refrigerator. But because they're expensive, there's this growing movement to use the much cheaper consumer-level graphics cards. And the best part about it was the performance of these consumer-level graphics cards was growing at an astonishing rate. So there was a plethora of research into the software solutions for, for driving these distributed graphics. Now, uh, we were being funded by DOE ASCII, and ASCII was and, and still is about large-scale computation to support science. So our goal was rendering capacious amounts of geometry that was generated by these large-scale computations. So we did a lot of research that analyzed the behavior of the different parallel uh, rendering approaches that were available. Uh, there are different techniques, sort first, sort last, but we quickly concluded that the sort last algorithms were the way to go. Uh, the way the sort last algorithms work is that the re rendering primitives are statically assigned to processes, and all the processes render a full-size image with partial geometry. Then these images can be combined together to form a single correct image. So the great thing about this is that it has wonderful scalability, which is what we're most concerned with, this, this uh, large amount of geometry that you want to render. And simply adding geometry amortizes the cost of the sort-last parallel rendering algorithm. 
However, the biggest drawback, uh, both back then and today, was that bigger image means more overhead. So at the time when we set out to perform sort last on 60 million pixels, it was really a crazy idea. But the idea that we had behind Ice-T that nobody else seemed to, well, very few people actually seemed to address was that geometry is seldom uniformly distributed spatially. Uh, geometry tends to implement spatial coherency, which simply means that if the geometry is close together in memory, it's probably also close together spatially. And when you have spatial coherence, that means when one process renders its geometry, it's going to render its data in a very small part of the screen. And that's going to leave a lot of the pixels blank and they can be ignored. When you're in a tile display, that means a lot of the tiles can just be thrown away. So the algorithms in ICT are designed to throw away these blank tiles and balance the compositing of the remaining sparse set of tiles. So I've, I've seen the sort first, sort last stuff appear in a... Uh, what's the piece of software? Chromium, which I believe is now um, a, a defunct project, but that was actually for GL acceleration rendering. Is Ice-T involved in the hardware acceleration pipeline, or is this before you even get to those calls? It's actually after. So Ice-T stands back and lets you render the geometry in any method uh, that is most applicable to your application. Uh, most typically today, that means using something like OpenGL to render something on a GPU. After that rendering is finished, remember the rendering is done on a partial set of geometry. You grab these images back, and then Ice-T works generally at the CPU level and message passing interface to combine these images into a single cohesive uh, unit that you can show to the user. How does Ice-T know like, where things are placed in memory then if the geometry is already done? I guess, I guess I'm not quite following what's going on here. Okay. Um, the way the sort last algorithm works is that it doesn't really matter where the geometry is. So each unit renders, each process renders its geometry locally to an image. And uh, not only to rendering an opaque surface, you'll render both the colors that you'll see on the screen, but you'll also render a Z buffer, which is for each pixel how far away the nearest polygon was. Then you read back the color and this depth, and then you can, what you call, composite the images together. So on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis, you look at the Z buffer, and you see which pixel is closest, and you color by that color. And of course, IC's algorithms do this in a parallel nature, so they'll be doing this over you know, so many processes, passing messages back and forth. So you mentioned uh, you work on ParaView, and actually uh, ParaView and a similar uh, piece of software called Visit is where I first learned about Ice-T. You can use those in a tile environment without Ice-T. Are they just using stuff that like comes with VTK, or what exactly is... So you described what Ice-T does. What are they doing in these other methods that is so much slower than what Ice-T is doing? All right. I, I can't speak to Visit, but I can speak to ParaView. When you use ParaView now, it's always using Ice-T for its uh, tile display rendering. Um, there is a mode where Ice-T will just go behind the covers and let you distribute the geometry across all of everything to make things go faster. But in general, the only parallel rendering implemented in ParaView is Ice-T, and that's because it's the fastest algorithm we have available. Okay, okay, so what I was reading must have just been referring to Ice-T becoming standard, and they just stopped calling it Ice-T. Yes. <laughs> Most likely because, because Ice-T has taken over all the parallel rendering in ParaView, okay. oftentimes people don't even bother to say it anymore. Okay, so the next thing I had was what was the relationship between Ice-T, ParaView, and Visit. I didn't know that you worked on ParaView before now, uh, so... Of course, ParaView is the primary consumer of Ice-T, or is there other products out there that use Ice-T? So ParaView was certainly the first, and that's simply because we went from developing rendering algorithms like Ice-T to working on full systems like ParaView. So when we, when we started developing within ParaView, we became insistent on using efficient you know, rendering libraries, and of course we, we liked Ice-T because not only was it ours, but it's it's again, the fastest one we had available. 
um, since then, I know of a few other projects that started to work with it. Um, as you mentioned, Visit has taken in and has now uh, enabled that for use on their tile displays. Uh, the, I do know of at least one other project from the uh, French Atomic Energy Commission that's using ICT in some of their in-house visualization tools. Okay, but ICT is something that's not really user visible. Uh, someone using one of these products would just see the composite on a tile display just go that much faster. Yeah, that's correct. Likewise, for for example, OpenGL and MPI, uh, the user really shouldn't be too concerned with the libraries underneath. Just that the application that they're directly interfacing with works. So here's a question: Would you ever use ICT? on a traditional compute cluster, like a, a headless cluster, not, not something driving a tile display? Uh, absolutely. Matter of fact, we at Sandia use it for that method all the time. Uh, as I mentioned before, at least in Paraview, uh, ICT is the only parallel rendering algorithm at all. Uh, we use it not only for tile displays, but we use it for what we call desktop delivery. And that's when you have connected from your desktop to you know, some remote rendering cluster, and it's in parallel generating images and sending them back to the client. These images are comparatively small, and we're talking, you know, uh, a million pixels. And uh, ICT is used for that compositing as well. Okay, so it, would it also be involved in like a static rendering of an image? I mean, instead of sending it to the user display, you just dump it to disk, right? You could do it for that, yes. Okay. So uh, you already said that Ice-T comes into play after the GPU, so Ice-T does not depend on any GPU-specific MESA or GL implementation. Yeah, correct. The current API depends on OpenGL, but fairly superficially. Um, as long as you have an OpenGL context, Ice-T will work fine, and X, GPU, MESA, all of these will provide an OpenGL context. Now. Uh, as I mentioned, this is kind of a superficial dependency. So in the future, we're planning to re release this restriction. You'll probably still use OpenGL most of the time because that's the easiest rendering library to use. But you could potentially use something different, for example, uh, Mantha as a ray casting solution. Okay, yeah, that would actually be interesting to put this behind a, a CPU ray tracer instead. Okay, so how complicated actually is ST from someone who wanted to implement it in their piece of software? Uh, if someone wanted to use ICT on a desktop graphical app that was rendering something to take advantage of you know, modern multi-core processors, so they wanted some sort of parallelness in their application, is ICT where they should start or should they start with something else and then move to ICT? Well, that depends on your situation. Um, so, for example, as I mentioned, Manta. Manta is itself a multi-core rendering library. So, it would, if you're just dealing with one multi-core system, it would wouldn't make sense to put Ice-T on top of that. Uh, Ice-T was designed to be distributed memory. It works just fine on 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 an SMP machine. You just treat it as a distributed memory system, but only if your application al also treats it in that manner. Uh, for example, you could run Paraview uh, as a an MPI job on a on an SMP multi-core machine. Uh, you would just treat it as as a distributed memory system. Now, how hard is it to I integrate IST into an application? It's typically pretty straightforward because IST doesn't enforce any type of data management or rendering style. As, as I mentioned, you can use whatever type of rendering uh, you have available and send the images back into Ice-T. It does this through rendering callbacks. So whenever Ice-T needs an image, it just calls this rendering function that you provided and gets an image back. Some people are probably wondering, but you already said it relies on GL superficially. Uh, you can run Ice-T using a software implementation of GL for rendering, right? Like if you were running it on a cluster without GPUs. Yes, and we do that all the time. That's actually a pretty common use of some of these applications? Yeah, here at Sandia, we have several uh, clusters that weren't specifically designed to be visualization clusters, so they don't have GPU uh, hardware, and we do exactly what you said. We use the Mesa software rendering library uh, and uh, ICT with that, and it works just fine. 
So you mentioned Ice T's really focus for out, you know, between boxes, distributed memory. Uh, is there many applications outside traditional HPC where you see Ice T as being useful? Uh, I see Ice T as well suited for any application which deals with large meshes that are rendered and where detailed matters. And if you're talking about a really large scale scalable, uh, uh, scalable system, uh, we're going to be talking about distributed memory anyway. So this is where Ice T fits very well. Um, other possible application areas I can think of, uh, for example, uh, oil and gas has large geological surveys as long as, uh, along with simulations, and they could benefit. In fact, I, I've seen some examples of oil and gas actually using uh, ICE-T. Uh, I can imagine things like weather and climate studies or medical applications. Like as I said, pretty much anywhere that ICE-T is, uh, excuse me, anywhere that uh, you're dealing with large data, and, and the detail matters. So right now, something like a, a regular HD movie rendering, those are still small enough images every frame that Ice-T wouldn't be beneficial for them. Uh, sure, it, it could be beneficial. As I said before, we use Ice-T for parallel rendering of smaller images, images that you send to your client. Um, and, and an HDTV signal is just fine. You could, you could render that as a single image or you could break it up into tiles if you want. You have that choice with Ice-T. But we found that Ice-T is very efficient at even at the smaller images. It, it was rather interesting, even though we specifically designed Ice-T for tile displays, uh, we find that we don't uh, often use them for tile displays. We more often use them for, for a single display, which we call the single tile display. So you found that you just made something that worked well in the large case that also worked well in the small case? Yeah, so the optimizations that we did in ICE-T to you know, basically get rid of all the unused pixels uh, work just as well when you're dealing with a single image as they work when you're dealing with multiple tiles. So compared to other compositing me uh, methods, uh, just how much faster is Ice-T over some well-known methods? Well, uh, as far as compositing is concerned, uh, if you're dealing with small images, uh, Ice-T will revert to a binary swap algorithm, which is a pretty common technique. Um, but nevertheless, Ice-T's implementation is efficient and makes good use of these data reduction techniques that I mentioned. Um, if you're talking about a tile display, uh, these algorithms are unique to Ice-T, and they're less comparable. Um, if you're doing a naive approach using a sort-last technique, you'll get a much greater speed up than that, like uh, uh, you know, about 10 times possibly. Now that said, there are other techniques other than sort-last that can be used in a tile display. Um, for example, you mentioned Chromium uh, and its predecessor, WireGL, which had very good sort-first implementation for tile displays, uh, which could get much, much faster frame rates than Ice-T particularly when you have really big images. But in the same approach, if you had a lot of data geometry, they would slow to a crawl. Uh, Ice-T can handle much larger geometry than those techniques could handle. And this is why I specifically state that Ice-T is, is good if you have uh, applications with lots of detail and the detail matters. So how well did, uh, this is a question Jeff had, how well does MPI fit to your communication needs when working with Ice-T? So message passing, passing is a good fit for ICE-T and an image compositing algorithms in general. So ICE-T uses MPI for all its communication. Technically, it's possible to swap out a different communication library, but nobody ever does. And what kind of hardware should someone be running this across? Is the type of messages that ICE-T relies on short and latency sensitive, or are they large and seldom, so they're bandwidth sensitive? Um, well, you could say that they're both. Uh, Ice-T tries to pass large messages, so you do want large bandwidth. But latency matters too, because remember that we're talking about parallel rendering. And if you have an interactive application, you want to have this done in fractions of a second. So if you have a large latency on your interconnect, uh, you're not going to get very fast frame rates. So you wouldn't really want to run this on a traditional like Ethernet cluster? You'd want to use some sort of high-performance interconnect? No, your, your performance is going to be very bad on your traditional uh, Ethernet. Right? You want a high-speed interconnect. What exactly... Oh, you were distinguishing between 
a, a large geometry versus a large image. Um, could you explain on that a little more so it's a little clearer? I'm I'm not very familiar with that. Okay, so large geometry is the the input of what you're rendering. So you can imagine you're say rendering a, a building and you can implement the building with very small geometry which would be you know a square for each wall and a square for the roof and that would be very small geometry or you could have a separate square for each one of the bricks in the building and have thousands of these bricks that you're all rendering at a time that's the difference between the geometry size of the input to IST and of course, the image size is fairly straightforward. It's the, the can total count of pixels on your display. So you could have, as you mentioned, your HD TV image. It's uh, 1080 by uh, 1080 by uh, sorry, 1920 by 1080. Or you could you could pile these up so you could have you know 16 of those, and and add up the pixels. IC was specifically designed to handle large in both sense, both large input geometries and large displays. It's a very difficult and uh, computationally intensive problem. So what is then the largest, well, I, I don't know exactly what the metric for geometry would be. Would that be the number of vertices or something like that? Or so? Usually you count pixels, pixels. but vertices is fairly comparative. Okay. So what's the largest geometry ever rendered using Ice-T versus what's the largest um, image ever rendered with Ice-T? Uh, it's been so long since I've actually counted geometry. Uh, I know back five, seven years ago, we were talking on the orders of half a million uh, polygons, and that actually seems pretty small to date. I know we've rendered geometries that come from over a trillion cells, but uh, we run access servers on those, so I think the actual number of polygons we rendered was smaller than that. But it's pretty close, on the order of, of billions. Uh, as far as the display was is concerned, I'm not exactly sure what the largest images ever created. I can tell you the ones that we used to create were around 63 million pixels because we had a very large display that uh, had 63 million pixels. Um, it was huge. It was 15 feet across. Um, so even today, that that seems a little bit excessive because you kind of had to walk back and forth just to see the the entire display. I don't know if anyone has ever rendered anything larger than that. It's possible, but there's no real limit on the image size that comes out of Ice T because Ice T is careful with its memory allocation not to hold more than say two or three tiles worth of image data on any process at any one time. So as long as you have enough computers to display uh, the tiles, IST should be able to generate the image. So back with comparing IST to Chromium, Chromium sat behind the application and intercepted the actual GL draw calls, if I understood it correctly. IST yes, goes right. in the actual application you're running. If somebody, what would you tell somebody who has an existing GL visualization app and they want to run it on a display wall? Right. Well, if they have a serial application, something like Chromium is perfect for that because we're not talking about huge amounts of geometry, most likely. So uh, the Chromium approach, the sort first approach, is going is going to be much more efficient than the the IST approach. Now. If they were claiming that uh, they couldn't render very fast even on their, their local display because they had so much geometry overloading their, their application, um, they're going to have to paralyze their application. And regardless of whether you use Ice-T or Chromium, um, that's probably going to be the hardest part of your development. Inserting a parallel rendering library on top of that is going to be fairly straightforward. And also to actually use Chromium in a fully parallel manner. So Chromium, I believe you mentioned, also has a, a sort last algorithm in there, although that sort last algorithm doesn't work on tile displays. If you were to use that, you would actually have to make modifications to your application to tell Chromium how to do certain things and also to, to drive Chromium in a parallel manner. So uh, regardless, is you're going to have to make changes in order to make your your basic application and data handling parallel, and then putting either Ice T or Chromium on top of that is is about the same same amount of effort. 
So what are you seeing the future of these uh, scientific scale visualization applications going? Are they, more and more of them are going the, it's got all the rendering and compositing technology in the app and not in the system? I'm not sure I understood the, the question between app and system. A uh, system level would be like you know Chromium where you run the app and then the system takes care of splitting up the geometry and sending it to different tiles or breaking up rendering between them. Um, I think for the most part, uh, the parallel rendering algorithms aren't going to change dramatically. And they were originally designed for the most part 10 years ago. There's been tweaks here and there. But they haven't changed all that much, and I don't expect them to change dramatically either. Now, whether you go for a system level or app level, I, I, I guess it depends on on what your needs of your application are. I, I guess for Ice-T, it doesn't going at a system level doesn't isn't really necessary because all of your parallel operations are are after the system level is finished. Whereas for the Chromium approach, it's really convenient to be able to do the sort first and then intercept that at the system level. But as you scale up higher and higher, uh, particularly with more and more input data, uh, that approach simply doesn't scale with your input data. So it, it, it's simply not going to be feasible. So since methods aren't changing, if someone has an existing parallel app that kicks out you know, massive amounts of data and they want to scale up their visualization needs, should they just take something like Visit or ParaView that's an extendable parallel um, system already and just make a data reader for their format for those systems? That would probably be the most straightforward way of doing it, yes. Okay. Okay, so what's coming for the future of Ice-T? Well, the most ex exciting upcoming work uh, is work that I'm doing with Tom Paterka and with Kendall from Argonne National Laboratory. So uh, they have a recent new sort last algorithm called Radix K that is supposed to outperform sort last, uh, particularly when you have um, a whole lot of cores. So we're going to integrate the recent Radix K algorithm in IST and compare it to the existing algorithms, and then perform metrics in IST for up to 100,000 cores. People are still trying to use Chromium because they have something and they just want to blow it up on a wall, and there's no nice way to do that currently. Um, Sage, I believe, is similar, but I've not investigated Sage enough for people to know if that's going to work well. Yeah. I don't know a lot about Sage, but I have gotten uh, several emails from one of the developers because he is integrating Sage into Paraview and the IST code in Paraview. So uh, IST is doing the, the multi tile compositing, and they're taking Sage and and streaming the, the images to a remote tile display. So it's kind of interesting work. Yeah, it seems like everything now, you have to be written for a tile display to really take up, you know, to take advantage of one. Chromium was a nice gap, but nobody's working on it, so it's kind of dead. Yeah, like I said, the, the Chromium, particularly its predecessor, WireGL, uh, the idea being you could take your serial application and just blow it up in a tile display was just a really cool idea. I mean, it worked amazingly well. But if you if your if your application is growing, particularly for scientific uh, visualization where you have lots of data, that approach doesn't work. You have to parallelize your original input, and then suddenly trying to parallelize on the system level OpenGL streams makes less sense. Well, Ken, thanks a lot. Uh, is there a what's the website for Ice T and um, contact information? All right, so the w Ice T website is www.cs.unm.edu slash tilde kmoral slash ice-t and the contact person would be me k-m-o-r-e-l at sandia.gov Okay, Ken, thank you very much for your time. Alright, thank you.